Um, I would love to hear a bit about your motivations to start and, and how you got interested in the current work that you're doing. Um, well, I got interested in the work that I do, which is mainly weapons of mass destruction, um, chemical, biological, nuclear, and radiological issues, uh, nonproliferation, arms control, uh, really when I was a fellow at the uh, Department of Defense. And I had just received my master's and my law degree, and so I went to work there as a lawyer in the international law section. And actually, I did not have any idea exactly what I wanted to focus on. And so I was actually, uh, one day at work, I was actually a little bored. And so I, I asked my mentor if I could go with him to a meeting. And at the meeting, uh, it was uh, what they call an interagency meeting, where there were a number of individuals from different agencies and departments in the United States, and they were um, figuring out what directions and instructions they were going to send to a U.S. delegation overseas negotiating a treaty. And it was on strategic weapons and nuclear weapons issues. And I just fell in love with it. I said, this is really interesting. And so that's kind of how I got started, totally by accident. And I really liked the, liked the field, and so I've stayed with it all these years. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, I'd love to talk during our fireside chat about both the nuclear weapons, mm -hmm. biosecurity, and then some of your work on diversity. Great. Um, and maybe to start on the, um, the nuclear weapons front. Um, I was wondering, considering likelihood, severity, and how much can actually be done to reduce risk, what nuclear threats do you think deserve the most attention this century? Um, I think a couple of things. One of the things that I did when I was working uh, in, in government recently is trying to secure all vulnerable nuclear material. And the reason why we were doing that is because if you want to make a nuclear weapon, you need highly rich uranium or plutonium. If you don't have those two, you can't build a weapon. And so a lot of the work that we were focused on was trying to make sure that any existing plutonium and uranium in the world was secure, uh, making sure that any, any such material was consolidated and wasn't unnecessarily sitting someplace. Um, and so the summits that we had really focused on that. And we had about 50 countries who were focused on ways in which we could uh, strengthen the, uh, the protection of nuclear material. Um, the other thing that, that worries me, I guess, is uh, what they call a new potential arms race. You know, we have a situation where um, we had the uh, Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty uh, between the U.S. and Russia, which the uh, U.S. withdrew from. Uh, we had the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action with Iran, which the U.S. withdrew from. Um, and so and we have another treaty called the Strategic Arm Reduction Treaty, which will expire if it's not extended by the U.S. and Russia. Um, and so a lot of the people who work on arms control are very concerned about a new arms race because we don't have the treaties that we used to have, and we don't have the monitoring we used to have, and we don't have the dialogue that the treaties provided between countries. And so that's, that's an issue that people are concerned about now. Yeah. Do you think that we've made improvements overall in keeping weapons, keeping weapons safe? We have made a lot of improvements, uh, and we continue to do so. I mean, we don't often hear about it, but there's a lot of work that's going on and a lot of countries are involved in, including the UK, um, in securing all types of weapons of mass destruction. So not only nuclear weapons, but there's a lot of work that's going on to secure biological pathogens around the world and in vulnerable places, chemical precursors as well, um, and, and radio radioactive materials. So there's quite a bit that's going on um, and countries are working collaboratively to try to make sure that um, these materials and pathogens and precursors are secure and that non-state actors with intent to do harm do not get their hands on them. Yeah. Um, I have a bunch of questions related to the, the biological weapons, but just sticking on um, nuclear weapons for a minute and thinking about securing vulnerable materials, are there any approaches within this field that you think are promising but neglected? Um, well, I, I would say that there's, a, there's been a lot of promise uh, with the nuclear security summits that we had. We had four. I think the concern now is that the focus is, has shifted. Um, I think as you have every new administration has different ideas and different goals and things that they would like to do. And one of the major things that President Obama was focusing on was, was the issue of nuclear terrorism and trying to prevent that. Um, so I think whenever you have a new administration, of course, that may not be as important as other issues are not important. So I think the problem now is that there's a reduction of focus on that, which means if there's a reduction in focus, a lot of times that also could mean a reduction of emphasis and policy and funding. Um, so this work has been going on for a number of years. Um, regardless of who was president, we've been working on issues like this since the 
fall of the Soviet Union, really. Um, so the work continues, but there's not as much emphasis and it's not as much leadership um, by the U.S. on these issues. Got so. it. It sounds like um, less of an issue of research and more of an issue of political tractability. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One thing that folks, um, some individuals within the effective altruist community are thinking about is how emerging technologies will intersect with nuclear weapons and particularly how um, AI might change things like automatic deployment. Mm -hmm. Is this something that you think about or explore in your work? Um, it is something that I think about. It's not something that I do personally. I know a lot of colleagues who do because there is a concern with technology and what's emerging and what capabilities that will provide uh, countries and what they can do. And we know that there's always going to be an interest in countries to dig into other countries and see what they can, what they can find out through technology. So, uh, and it's no different with nuclear weapons and a concern about what could be, what is possibly being developed that will allow a country or an individual to get access to uh, what can be used to for nuclear weapons, you know, in mm -hmm. the U.S. So that is a strong concern that we have. Do you think if automatic deployment becomes more commonplace in terms of nuclear weapons on balance that would make the world safer or less safe? If more, if... If, uh, if automatic deployment, so like if AI systems are used in terms of automatic deployment um, in regards to nuclear weapons, mm -hmm. do you think on balance that would make the world safe, less safe? Maybe you think that's unlikely to happen in the first place. I would think it would make it less safe um, if it's automatic deployment. Yeah, yeah I'm, not, I'm not sure that's something that we would want. <laughs> yeah. Um, one thing that um, some folks in the effective altruist community think about um, is uh, uh, thinking about the moral relevance, not just of individuals that are currently living, but also future generations. Mm -hmm. um, and then also, as a result, thinking about things that could have kind of um, disproportionate impact on individuals um, that uh, could could change not the world just that we live in currently, but also um, change the world significantly in the future as well. Um, and so sometimes folks uh, that are exploring this space are thinking about tail risks um, or things that might be unlikely to happen but have very significant impacts um, for the world today. Um, I'm curious when you see folks talk about tail risks successfully within policy, are there ways um, that they generally approach that um, and avoid coming off talking, you know, seeming as like extremists or um, approaching things in too doomsday of a way? Well it's, well, it's interesting because a lot of people in the policy world actually kind of think that way because um, we, in, in the area that I deal with, um, you could look at something like nuclear weapons, which is, would they say, not as likely, but the, re but the result will be very big, versus something like radiological weapon use, which is much more likely, um, but the result will not be as big. Um, and so there is, um, there's always some feeling of and talk of these huge catastrophic results, even if it may, be, may not be likely. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes that's, that's used to get attention, you know, because sometimes people won't pay attention to something unless they are shocked and scared into thinking about why it's important. So for the policymakers, it's not as big of a deal. It may be for other sectors, but for a lot of policymakers, that's how they think and that's how they try to get something across to people is to show how, how big an effect it could actually have, even if it's not as likely. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And then as we think about um, nuclear and biological threats, um, do you think that there is a possibility um, that these threats could um, kill a lot of people or actually cause human extinction, or do you think those tail events are, um, are unlikely? Um, no one wants to say it's unlikely. Um, I think uh, we want to say that you know we haven't we haven't had obviously a, a nuclear weapon incident since the 40s. Um, we haven't had a huge biological incident. People wonder why not because it's a lot easier to do and it's all dual use. Um, you know, and we've had little little cases of you know botulism here or a few people got sick because somebody threw something in a salad. Um, but there hasn't been any big biological incident. So um, I guess my answer would be one, not as much in, in the nuclear um, field as much as in the bio field, um, but it hasn't happened in knock on wood. There's any wood here. <laughs> <laughs> it hasn't really happened in the bio uh, yet, so 
Um, yeah, they're big, not as likely, fortunately. Um, fortunately, we're in a case where we've had, countries have had these weapons for a long time in a nuclear site and have not used them, yep. you know. What? Why don't we use that as a, a way to pivot into um, talking a little bit mm -hmm. about biosecurity and biological weapons? Mm -hmm. um, I know that you played a central role in the launch of the global uh, health security agenda. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us a little bit about what that was and what was what it was like to work on that? Um, well, the global health security agenda happened because uh, it actually happened because we in 2013. Uh, it was launched in 2014. In 2013, a colleague from the White House said. We need to think about the fact that we're having all these diseases, infectious diseases that are happening much more rapidly. Uh, we had H1N1, we had H1N9, we had SARS, you know, just these things kept happening. And there was a desire to figure out what do we do about that. So we decided for, that we would go for one day on the weekend in the basement of her place and have some wine. It's a very nice basement. Um, and just kind of talk about the situation. So we had two people from a number of different departments. So I was there from State Department. We had someone from the White House, Department of Defense, um, USAID uh, uh, that does development, um, USDA that does animals and, and plants, and, I mean, all the alphabet suits, FBI, FDA that does food, all of them were there. Um, CDC, of course, HHS, Health and Human Services was there. Um, and we sat around and we tried to say, what are we going to do about this? How, is there something that we could do? And we knew we needed to do something big and something global. We also knew that the World Health Organization, so they have these international health regulations that are international, that, that are international legal binding obligations on all countries, that countries were, were supposed to say that if they, that they're supposed to be um, compliant with them. And if they're compliant with them, that they could, then they're actually saying we, are, we have the capacity to do an infectious disease outbreak. But we also knew that less than 30% of countries could say that. And that was all based on self-assessments. So it could be even less. And so we knew in 2014 countries would have to report to the, the World Health Organization about whether they can actually say they have the capacity to deal with an infectious disease outbreak. And so all of these things were kind of thinking in our, we were thinking about this. We also realized that the anthrax attacks in the U.S. cost like a billion dollars. Uh, so we saw the financial results of that. Um, and then we had to deal with something called antimicrobial resistance, which is a big issue because um, humans are developing um, resistance to antibiotics, so are animals, uh, and it's a big issue. And so it's, a, uh, it's something that the international community and the health community is trying to deal with. Um, and then, of course, there is the fact that 70% of the diseases that, American, that, America, that uh, humans get come from animals because people are living closer and closer to animals. And so there's this huge uh, animal-human transmission. All of these factors led us to realize that we need to do something. Um, and so we decided in 2013 that we would launch something that would be global, because like I said, it would have to be global. All countries have to work on it. And we'd have to try to help countries uh, strengthen their capacity to resist infectious disease um, and help them to live up to their IHR obligations from the World Health Organization. And we realized it would have to be we, look, we have to look at all aspects of the disease, from prevent, detect, to respond. So the goal of the GHSA is to prevent, detect, and respond to infectious disease threats. And I was brought in through the prevention side, because the prevention side includes not just immunization and antimicrobial resistance issues, but also preventing bad people from getting their hands on biopathogens. So because of that, I was brought into the, uh, this effort that included all these different um, entities that would be represented in every country that we work with. They would have all their equivalent, all the different departments, um, all working together in a whole of government approach to try to deal with this disease. This disease. So that's how I got brought into it. And that's how I started working on it. And so now when we think about biosecurity, it's also part of this larger umbrella of GHSA. And the last thing I'll point out is that we launched it in 2013 in Washington on a snow day. The government was closed. The only place open was Health and Human Services. We had about 20 um, um, and people come in from different countries. They made it before the snowstorm. Um, and so it was the only building open. We had a video feed from Geneva with the D Director General from the World Health Organization. And we launched this. And then a month after that, we had Ebola. And so Ebola happened. And so that really made us understand why we need to have this global effort to build capacity of countries around the world to, disease, to uh, address infectious disease threats. It's a long answer, I know. <laughs> no, no, it's fascinating. Um, 
Uh, I'm curious how you feel currently about the, the global health security situation. Um, there's a lot has been accomplished. If anyone's ever interested in finding out some of the success stories, it's online. Uh, you can just go to ghsagenda.org. It has a list of success stories. I was in Liberia. Um, the second time they had Ebola, there was a, they, had, they were Ebola free, and then there was another case. Um, and I was there during that, and they had made a lot of successes, a lot of, they made a lot of steps um, toward being much better at detecting the disease. Um, but there's still a lot, there's still a lot of need out there. I mean, this is a big effort. It's a big effort to give for countries to have the capacity that they need to really deal with infectious disease threats because it's everything from what I said about prevention, there's detection, there's laboratory strengthening, there's multi-sector response, there's getting the personnel. Um, I was in, like I said, I was in Liberia. They have hospitals that don't, are not open all the time, they don't have water all the time. I mean, there's so many parts of this issue um, that has to be addressed, but there has been a lot of successes. Mm -hmm. And then you have what's going on in the Congo right now, which throws in a whole different scenario, which is, um, you know, strife and, and um, what's going on in the country itself, which was going on before, in terms of how, in, how, uh, how unsafe it is for, the, for people to go and work there. So now the CDC from the U.S. is not able to work directly with patients, which is the first time that this has ever happened to them, that they could not go to a country and work directly to, with, the, with the sick. But they were told they can't because the situation is so difficult, people are getting kidnapped. Um, so it threw in a whole, different, a whole different side to this effort to try to combat infectious disease that we hadn't thought about. Yeah. One thing that I've also heard folks describe about biosecurity is that there are cycles of panic and neglect, mm -hmm. or will, where an incident will happen like Ebola, there'll be a lot of political support, and then after some period of time, that's mm -hmm. less on the radar, even though the importance of prevention is still mm -hmm. um, still the same. I'm curious if that's something that you've observed in your work. Um, I think that, yes, I think that's part of human nature. I think it's human nature to, to, to get in the panic about something that's right in your face, and it's not in your face anymore, you kind of like forget about it, and you go back to what's, what's considered normal. Um, so certainly in that respect, and in fact, we were able to get, a, uh, in the U.S., we were able to get a, um, a, a, an amount of money that was dedicated to the effort of GHSA, and a lot of it went to Ebola in West Africa, but the rest was to help other countries. But then when Zika came along, they took money from that to deal with Zika. We kept saying, don't take money from GHSA because that's a long-term strategic effort to try to fix this situation. Um, but then the, instead of, of giving m new money to a new disease, they took money from the strategic effort, which made it less likely we could do some work in other countries that we wanted to do. Um, so that's one part of the problem is, you know, is that we also don't plan ahead. We're not very good at prevention. We're good at response. We like to respond. We, okay, so we know something happened, let's respond. But it's always more expensive to respond than to prevent. But, as a, but we naturally... Human nature is very much, okay, something's out of our face, let's forget about it. You know, and it's also human nature not to plan and prevent something that they can't put their hands on because they can't, it's not concrete enough. And so we're always reactionary to something and we can't really get ahead of it. So it's a problem. Can you tell me a little bit about um, tractable opportunities within the prevention space, things that you wish you, you think could be effective and you saw, wish you saw more of? Um, I wish there was more um, effort put on, you know, um, obviously, you know, the securing the, 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 the pathogens. We did a lot of work on what they call security culture, which is trying to talk to scientists to help them understand the importance of security. That has been taken back some. We've gone backwards on that. Um, because, as you know, scientists, the profession is to, to explore to do new things, to find um, cures, to write about it, to research, to publish. Um, and, but it's the same people who we have to worry about um, have the knowledge to build a weapon because everything is dual use. Unlike in nuclear weapons, where you need those two things to make a nuclear weapon, if you don't have it, you can't do it. And the bio field is totally different because everything is dual use. So everything that you can use to build something that will prevent a disease, you can use it 
to create a disease. And so we needed to, we spent a lot of time talking to scientists to let them know that we're not saying that you're a bad person. We're not saying that you're gonna do something bad. We just want you to understand why when you walk out the door, you have to lock the windows, you gotta lock the doors, you have to do all these things. Um, that is really important. Um, unfortunately, we're not doing that as much. Um, I'm not in government now, but I've been told that that's been, that's kind of to, taken a step back in terms of that education that we need to do. So there's things, that, and these things are constant. You really can't stop. There's always going to be scientists who learn, um, always new diseases that come up, always nanotechnology and all these other technologies that every time you have a new technology, every, have, every time you have something new, it can also be used for bad. And so it's a constant thing, particularly in the bio field, that you have to constantly worry about. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm surprised to hear about the step back. Do you have any sense of like what, what factors were that influenced that? I think it's just, like I said, you have different, you have change of administration, so different administrations want to focus on different things. It's just the way it is. I mean, yep. it doesn't matter whether you're, it doesn't matter who it is, it's just that just happens. And, um, and so I was fortunate enough to be in the administration. One of the reasons why I went back is because I knew there was going to be a focus on these things that I care about. Um, but, you know, it's just change administrations have different focus issues that they want to. So think, the work continues, it always continues. It may, you, know, you may not hear about it as much because it's not something that is, you know, a top issue. Um, it just may not get as much attention or as much funding. So. Is there space for think tanks or research institutions or NGOs that are op operating in like complementary cycles to what's going on in government that can like fill in some of those spaces? Oh yeah, or? there's a huge, I mean one thing I did not talk about is the importance of the non-governmental sector on these issues. Um, one of the things that I did for the GHSA was I did a lot of work for the, with the non-governmental sector which is think tanks, academic institutions, NGOs, philanthropy, um, research, there's a lot going on outside. There's so much going on outside government that there's no way that government could do it all anyway because we can't, we can't touch the, everyone in the world. So yes, there's still work that's being done by NGOs, there's philanthropy, foundations that's continuing to give money to NGOs and, and, and research institutes and, and um, academic institutions to help with that. And so some NGOs, and they're good because they're on the ground a lot more. They, they have different relationships with people. So we have always, in the government, give money to NGOs to do a lot of the work that the government can't do. Um, and that continues now. And because, and when there's less, there's less work by the government, then there's more work by the NGOs. It kind of goes that way. Yeah. yeah. Um, my expectation would be that a lot of the funding streams would still be controlled by kind of agendas within within the government, but there might be a unique opportunity for philanthropies or private mm -hmm. money to come in, especially if there's a change in right. what political agendas are. Right, and, and the philanthropy continues. I mean, philanthropy also, I used to work at the Ford Foundation, so I mean, you know, agendas at foundations also change, um, but, but foundations also like to fill in gaps. And so if they see there's a gap that's not being fulfilled by a government, and, they, and it's, a, it's an issue that that foundation cares about, then they will probably put more money in that by funding NGOs to do that work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. When you think about um, biosecurity risks, um, I hear um, some folks talk about avoiding accidents um, or trying to reduce the spread of, of something that's um, naturally occurring. And then there are some risks from deliberate misuse. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering how you think about prioritizing, you know, your level of concern related to some of these things in biosecurity. Um, that's a good question for level. Which one do I? Um, it depends on the circumstance. I mean, for example, um, if you have in Nigeria, um, you know, I know of a, a, an, an agency, an NGO that's actually working on securing biopathogens in the area in Nigeria where Boko Haram is. So in that case, that would be the major issue, would be biosecurity there. Um, but Ebola, for example, was a naturally occurring disease. Um, it wasn't because somebody did something, it's because it was a natural disease. So, you know, it's not like one always stays more important, it depends on the circumstance. And so, if you're talking about being in Boko Haram and you have biopathogens in the area, that's going to be your main thing is going to be you're always going to care about biosafety um, issues, um, but you want to make sure that that material is secure. You're not going to be as worried about naturally occurring diseases 
or natural or, or accidental, you're going to be much more concerned about that. Yeah. And then if you and if you're talking about Ebola, for example, you know when Ebola ha when Ebola happened, there was a concern by people in West Africa because a lot of the Ebola um, samples and things were being taken out of Africa and going back to Western countries, and they wanted to keep some of it in case they wanted to test it to build, you know. Maybe they could build their own vaccine, you know, and have that in the area. Um, and so there were cases of, thing, of they were missing. Ebola samples were missing. Um, and they were placed in place, and they were taken and put in places that were not very secure. And so that's where I get concerned because people can take a sample and use it for nefarious purposes. So we always want to make sure that, um, you know, that that stuff is always secure to make sure that, you know, the person who took it, is probably a scientist who has very good intentions, but you just don't know that, and you don't know where that person's putting it. Um, so once again, it's going to be biosecurity because not so much because of the Boko Haram situation, but because you're worried about where it might be, and you don't know where it might be. So yeah, I remember exploring uh, uh, different like uh, aspects of the space, and one of the things that surprised me the most was mm -hmm. um, just. Uh, concerns around accidents happening, so like air filters being turned the wrong way and things like yeah, that. And yeah. Um, yeah, I'm curious how much effort you think proportionally goes into building up healthcare infrastructure versus trying to prevent malicious actors versus um, trying to reduce accidental situations from happening. Yeah, I mean, without without having numbers, I would say a lot goes into because all the work that and I in, in the context that I'm aware. Of, all the work that the Center for Disease Control and uh, Health and Human Services and U.S. Uh, Department of Agriculture in the U.S., a lot of that is going toward not necessarily prevention. Some of it is. Um, not all of it is. So it's hard to say how much goes into each without having numbers. I don't think it's even. I don't think it's like one-third, one-third, one-third. I'm sure there's more in in some parts, whether it's prevent, detect, or respond. Um, but like I said, I, I don't I don't know numbers, but they're all they're all they're all important in terms of getting funding and things like that. Yeah, and then um, kind of last on the the biosecurity topic, are there are there approaches that you think are um, could poten potentially be really impactful, but are relatively neglected? Things you'd like to see more folks doing in this space? Um, you know, I just, just building up the workforce is important. I mean, you know, for example, whenever you have a disease happen, you have you lose a lot of your workforce. You lose a lot of the nurses and the doctors. And so that's a constant thing is having to make sure you have enough of the workforce um, there. But also, like, like infrastructure. I mean, you know, like I said, in Liberia, I was at a conference with doctors, um, but right outside somebody had gotten sick. Um, and there was no ambulance for for the for him because they they didn't have any ambulances. So, you know, it's 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 um it's a it's a it's even though they are better at detecting Ebola when it happened the second time, and that's a great uh, feat. It just shows you how much is part of a much bigger issue. It is part of a much bigger. If they had had twenty people rather than one or two, it would have been a different situation. Um, so it just shows that to, to deal with these issues, whether it's infectious disease or something else, it really is about development. It's really about developing the country in many ways to deal with these kind of threats. Yeah, yeah that's, mm -hmm. that's cool. Um, so changing topics a little bit, okay. um, I would love to hear about what led you to create the Women of Color Advancing Peace Security and what you, what you do as an organization. Okay, um, I established the organization uh, two years ago in 2017 after I left government. I left government in January 2017. Um, and it's something that I've wanted to do for a long time because um, policy making in the US and probably a lot of other places is not particularly diverse. You know, I've been in many meetings since I started working on these issues in the 90s. Um, and I've been to many meetings where I was the only person of diverse background, either the only woman or the only person of color, um, particularly in my area of hard security. Um, and that's changed a bit. There's, a, there's, there's more women in the field. Um, I'm seeing a lot of young women who are interested in the field, and hopefully they'll stay in the field um, in all these areas of, of security. Um, still very few people of color. Um, but I wanted to find a way to help encourage more understanding about these issues of threats, 
uh, more of appreciation, more of a desire to get into it, and more of a desire to stay into it. Because even in my case, as I said, it was totally by accident. It wasn't like somebody came to me at an early age and said, this is really interesting stuff, you may want to do it. I just happened to go to a meeting, and they were talking about it. I know many people who have stories as, oh, I was just, I just had a professor who said, you should take this course. Um, uh, and so it's not a lot of, um, and a lot of understanding early on about these issues. And so um, it's really to try to, to get us interested, but to get diversity at the table. There's really, it's very homogeneous, uh, the people who are sitting around the table talking about these issues, even though the effects of a lot of these threats um, and the foreign policy is for outside the US. And, and, and a lot of women, and when you talk about all, all kinds of security, whether it's the hard security or the quote unquote soft security, like climate change or food and water security or whatever you want, you know, oceans, whatever, um, is women who, because of their role in the family and in the community, and that usually bear the brunt of the ramifications, and particularly women of color, and yet they're not at the table just being part of the, how you put these things together, how do you decide the policies that are gonna affect the U.S. and people outside the U.S. So that was really my catalyst for wanting to start the organization. Yeah. And what do you expect to be some of the biggest benefits of increasing diversity and inclusion? Or like put a different way, what do you think are the biggest risks of remaining having, homogenous? Yeah. Um, well, the biggest risk is you continue to have a dialogue that's the same as it's always been. I mean, you know, it's been the same way. We don't know what we're missing. We don't know what other avenues there might be if we had different voices around the table, uh, different of all kinds of voices around the table. Um, and so, and we have a lot of really important threats that we're dealing with right now in terms of not just WMD, but climate change and all the environmental degradation that's happening. We need to have everyone around the table. We can't afford to not have people who may have a great idea. We don't know, we might have missed six or seven wonderful ideas about how to deal with climate change. And we don't ever know it because we didn't have an opportunity to hear the different voices who could have, who could have you know, had some input. So it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a situation where we can't afford to not have everyone who has a potential way of resolving the issue at the table because we just, we just don't have that luxury. And we never really did, we just took it for granted. Um, so you know, that's what happens if you don't have any people, people around the table. Um, some of the things I, I, I like seeing is um, just having, you know, seeing more people on TV talking about these substantive issues, um, seeing it in Washington, it's a lot of talk, you know, policy is a lot of talk, um, but you gotta be there, you gotta be at the think tank discussions, you gotta be at the academic discussions, you gotta be submitting the papers, and of course you gotta be in government. And so, you know, that's how you, that's, that's how you help to change policy, just having these voices at different parts. Um, I don't know how many of you saw the picture of, of Nancy Pelosi in the room where she was pointing her finger at, at President Trump. If you look at that photo, there are two women in that room. There's Nancy, there's a woman behind her, and I think, I think there's a third woman. I couldn't tell because she's kind of covered by Nancy, so there might, there might be three, but there's only two, I know for sure, and there's no person of color in that room. And that's the first thing I saw, and I said, now I can see why our policies are so, you know, are, are just, you know, one of the biggest problems right now is our foreign policy. And um, it, there's just no diversity of voices, and everyone's saying the same thing, and you talk to each other, and everybody starts thinking they're right, because everybody says, you're right, you're right, you're right, right. There's nobody can say, you know, you might want to think about it this way. So um, it's a disservice to all of us if we don't, if we don't have that. Yeah. So. Do you have uh, examples of stories where um, there has been increased diversity at the table and how mm -hmm. solutions or conversations might, go, might have um, gone differently in a positive way? Well, I mean, there's a lot of studies that's been done on the role of women in peace negotiations. And if women are at the table in peace negotiation, there's, I think, about a 50 or higher percent chance of those peace negotiations being sustained. And there's been studies on that, which you can find out. But also, um, just in my own circle, we talk about, you know, I did something called the Nuclear Security Summits. We had four summits. 
and it was led by the U.S., and we had other countries also host some of the summits. And a lot of it was run by a lot of women um, in, who were at the White House. Um, and, you know, it, there, it, was, it was a very inclusive discussions that we, they were very inclusive discussions. We had countries that don't ever talk to each other in terms of nuclear issues around the table. So you had Israel, Pakistan, and India around the table. They would never go to a nuclear nonproliferation treaty uh, talk, one, because they're not part of it, <laughs> they're, they're not part of the, the treaty, but also the issues are just, they would just not be able to talk to each other. Um, you had n a number of countries from the Middle East who were there, uh, because we were able to find a topic that was much more important than the issues they normally fight about. So you had Armenia and Azerbaijan there, even though they tried to fight with each other um, at times during, the, during, their, during their discussions, we, we, kept, we kept that um, low. Um, and so we were able to, f we were able to find a way to say, we don't, we, whatever your other issues are, um, religious, scientific, nuclear, in this space, we're talking about nuclear security because nobody wants a nuclear weapon detonated on their country, on their, on their territory. And everyone was able to rally around that and that's why we were able to do it, despite the fact that we had countries around the table that don't normally like to talk to each other. Um, and it was very successful, and you know, and I think part of it is because you had people who were helping to plan it, who had a very inclusive way of looking at it. It was all about the carrot and not the stick. It was about how do we work together, um, which is partly a trait of women in the way they are. Um, could you tell me a little bit m more about like what uh, what made that experience be able to bring together unique folks? Like why was why was that an exception potentially as opposed to um, a, in terms of how the how the setting was put together and who was invited? Um, um, why was an exception? Yeah, or like what made what made this space uh, more unique? Was it like the person that organized it? Was it was who was involved? The attendee list? Like how? Yeah, I think it, I think it, was, I think it was because the people who were putting it together um, just approached it very differently from the very beginning. Um, and like I said, it was it was approached from the beginning as being one that was very inclusive um, and trying to find ways to because we wanted it to be successful. And to be successful, you needed to have at least the countries who all have. Um, plutonium and um, uranium uh, possession. You know, we didn't have North Korea at the table, um, but we didn't, so we didn't have everyone, but we had quite a, we had a, lo a lot of those countries, we had countries who didn't have it, um, but we wanted to have as many of those countries as possible. So in order for it to be real, we had to have some of the countries who necessarily don't like each other. Um, but this was a much more important thing. And so I think having a lot of women who were planning it from the very beginning up through the, to, through the end of it was I think was a very important part of it. And the, and the people who were represented, like I was, the, I was the State Department representative to it. Um, the Department of Energy person um, was one time a woman, one time was a, a gentleman. Um, the, well, there was a woman who was running it for part of it. Um, uh, so there was just a lot, there was just a lot of women involved. Mm -hmm. Um, thinking about this um, from a different angle, um, something that we think about uh, at Center for Effective Altruism is how to create welcoming spaces for people from diverse backgrounds to come together um, and share examples of what they're doing well. And when we do that, um, sometimes folks in dominant demographic groups also ask us what they can do to be proactive, how they can be allies to create more welcoming and inclusive spaces. So I'm wondering if you have examples um, or specific stories of what this has looked like in your field? Um, and, and well, it's interesting because in the field in, in Washington, D.C., where, I, where I, I spend a lot of time, it's very much a place where the uh, gravitas is um, how many times you've been at a think tank um, panel, how many articles you've written, how many op-ed pieces you have. Um, uh, the level of what, what makes you important is different from like I'm from New York, for example. So in New York, it's about money. You know, it doesn't matter if you're if you're going to something. What's important is you know 
who are the people who are going to be there who have the cash. And in D.C., it's about who has the gravitas in, in terms of, you know, what they, who they are in terms of what they've written and what jobs they've had. Um, and so being an ally is different, I think, in different environments. Um, and, in, in, and the example for in D.C. is knowing how to step aside and give space to other people and other, and other issues. Um, because since people are, um, people are measured by how many panels they've been on, they don't necessarily want to give the space to somebody else because that means they can't be there. Um, and so it's a very much a place where everyone wants to soak up um, the panel space and the op-ed space and who wrote the op-ed first. And, um, and so it's not one that allows for uh, space to be given to others. Unlike in the business sector, um, which has a different bottom line, which is about money. And so they have, they have um, been much better at incorporating the diversity space because they have come to realize that more diversity at the table means they make more money in the end. So they're much more happy to do that, whereas in some spaces, like in Washington, for example, in policy space, um, the bottom line is totally different. The bottom line is not about how much money you make. So it's been a lot more, it's a, it's been a lot more difficult to get the concept of um, uh, ally being uh, moving over and letting others have a space uh, incorporated into that environment. Um, so being an ally is obviously being supportive, uh, promoting um, the goals of those who may not be the same, uh, who may be a different person than you, uh, but also giving the space. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's super interesting to think about just the incentive structure in different industries. I hadn't heard I hadn't heard that framing in the policy space before and some of the incentives that make it more difficult. Mm -hmm. um, are there examples um, that come to mind or like stories that you have where you think someone has done this really well? Yeah, on my on my website I have something called I have a page that's called Down with the Cause. And what I do is I put individuals who are who I think are good allies. Um, because they have, um, they they just get it. They get it. They understand it. They're not threatened by it. They're they're happy to give space to other people who are not like themselves. Uh, they don't necessarily see everything as a zero sum gain. They understand that there's a bigger cause and a, and a bigger thing that can be achieved by having different people around the around the table. Um, and they just and they and because they because they feel secure in themselves. Um, you know, they just, they're just much better at being allies because they don't see, they don't see things as a threat. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I mean, I have individuals there who are, you know, who just are promoting the goals of my organization, for example. They're always, you know, do you want to, do you want to host an event here? Let's host an event together. Um, you know, I, I want to let you shine. You know, I won't let your organization shine. I won't let the people from your organization shine. And you can tell they're good allies just because of the way they act. And it's not fake. It's, it's real. Mm -hmm. so. um, I, would, I would love to hear a bit more about your organization and, like, what is the theory of change or the key programs that you think about focusing on and why? Um, the organization really focuses on the pipeline and the institution. So we focus on bringing in, uh, you know, focusing on young women, mid-career women, uh, and we focus on the institutions and... Uh, working with institutions to uh, talk with them about the, the culture that's always the barrier to change. Um, and, you know, trying to, th trying to think through what are ways to make change that's lasting um, and what, a change, what things you could do to change culture or to alter the culture because culture takes a long time to change and that's what keeps things from being diverse. Um, so it's really focusing on the people and the institutions. Mm -hmm. But we, and we do a lot of things like trainings. We do, um, we have, we build our network. We help with jobs. We do podcasts. We do webinars. We have several working groups that focus on different substantive issues from cybersecurity to climate change to global health to weapons of mass destruction, national security issues. Um, and that gives an opportunity for people who want to focus on specific things. We do joint programs with other organizations. We have a pipeline program that we're starting. We have a mentorship program. Um, we do a lot of things to help empower uh, women and people of color mm -hmm. and allies. Yeah. 
Can you say a little bit more about the culture and how, how you would hope the culture would, would change? Um, well, the culture could change by just realizing that they have to change, which is the first part. Um, it's, it's, people are very, culture makes people comfortable, particularly if, it's, if you're part of the dominant culture. So if you're, so people who are in a dominant culture want things to stay they are because why would you want it to change? Because, because you have all the advantages, you have all the privileges, and so part of it is trying to help them recognize that they do, that that problem does exist. And it's a problem when it does not allow other, others who are not as privileged, who are not part of the dominant culture to be part of whatever's going on. Um, and so trying to, trying to talk about culture, um, trying to talk to leadership, because uh, leaders, leaders can help change culture faster than anything else. You can have a bottom-up approach, but if you have a leader that says, we're gonna do certain things, we're gonna do it now, um, it helps to change culture. So talking to leadership um, is a very big part of it. But it's slow. it's slow. It's slow because there's a lot of people who are comfortable with the way things are and they see a threat. And like I said, it's, it's more in some cultures than in other cultures. So like I said, in, in the business culture, it's a little for the most part, it's a little less of a problem because they want to make money, and that's the, what that's what they want. They want money. If it's like, okay, I don't care sitting there, I don't care who it is, if we're gonna get more money. That's the bottom line, mm -hmm. you know. And so it's different. It's going to be different for different cultures. Yeah. yeah. And are these things like pointing out microaggressions or inviting a diversity of you know different perspectives on an issue or trying to change how important it is for someone to you know consistently have the op-ed space? Mm -hmm. All of those aspects, or yes, all of those aspects. I mean, and, and all of those are active things that people have decided that they want to do. So when you have people who who have said, you know, the allies who said, you know, we want to invite you in, we want to share the space. That's that's one way to help change culture. Is have individuals who say that, and the more you have individuals who say that within a culture, the more likely the culture will change. Um, and because there's always going to be some who say, I don't want it to change. They're always going to be against it. I mean, this discussion of diversity and equity is happening all over Washington, for example. But there are still entities that are resistant. And, and you know, you just got to deal with the fact that there's going to always be those who just, they understand the privilege that they have and they don't want to give that up. So. Um, to end on a bit of a, a positive note, um, what keeps you going or inspires you as you, as you do your work? Um, I, I just enjoy what I do. I mean, I, I, I even though, you know, I, I spend my life working on weapons of mass destruction, terrorism, infectious disease, um, and now I teach a course at Georgetown where every, every class we have a different global threat we're talking about. Um, but I like to focus on the solutions. You know, in each class, you know, it's, the last week was about the oceans and biodiversity, and uh, next week is about human trafficking and, um, we always end talking about what are the solutions, what can we do to try to change it. Um, and I think that's particularly important for the younger generation to get a sense of, you know, I think they get bombarded with, you know, un with how much the world they have to, they will inherit has problems, environmental problems. And I think, I think letting, letting them know that there are solutions and helping them to think about what the solutions are is really important. So, um, I enjoy focusing on that. I enjoy focusing on the positive. And people say, how do you sleep at night? You know, I was working on my dissertation and it was about nuclear weapons. And I was working on the 9-11 Commission on terrorism. And that was my day. Every, you know, every night was about nuclear. During the day, it was about terrorists. Um, and they said, how do you sleep at night? I said, I sleep quite well, you know, because I spend my time trying to figure out how to stop things. I, I dedicate my life to trying to get rid of the weapons or try to make sure no one else gets their hands on them who shouldn't have them. And you know, that's that's my life, and I, that's all you can do. You can worry about it, but if you try to fix it, that can help you sleep at night. So, thanks so much for coming. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you.